Welcome back to It's Haunted, What Now? I'm your host, Lainey. Strange and sinister happenings are never really tied to one location, are they? Sure, all the horror movies that take place in homes, churches, or graveyards, or even hospitals, where, you know, bad things happen at some point or another. But in real life, something spooky can be waiting around just about any corner. The stories in this episode will take us from the safety of our own home, to work, to friends' homes, to school, and back home again. And remember, it's not always about the destination. Sometimes, the journey can be just as wild. Okay, ready to get spooked? Our first story comes from Round Wrap 4941 whose new home may have already had a shadowy inhabitant. I have been living in my house now for just over three months, from the day my husband and I moved in, I would always see a black shadow out of the corner of my eye. When we moved in, I was seven months pregnant, and as you can imagine, I was super eager to set up the nursery. Well, we got the room set up fine, but as soon as the crib and everything was in its place, it was like something changed. That same dark shadow of a figure started entering the nursery more and more. I know that black shadows are almost never a good entity, so even though it worries me, I've always ignored it, and acted like I didn't see anything. It doesn't help that my husband is not the type of person who believes in the paranormal, so I kept everything about the shadow to myself. Things didn't get bad until I gave birth to my son. Now, whatever it is, mimics his cries. Even my husband, who has never in his life believed in anything supernatural, is starting to hear it. We both do our best to ignore it, but we always share a look every time the mimic cries start up. Until tonight. Tonight was the first time I couldn't just ignore it. I have been struggling with postpartum depression, and I had decided to take a nice relaxing shower while my husband and son were both asleep. But there wasn't anything relaxing about it, because the whole time I was in the shower, I felt like eyes were on me, like I was being watched. When I got out of the shower, I felt better, like maybe I was imagining things so I decided to wash some bottles while I was still up and about. Then, as I was washing the bottles, I felt something behind me touch my back. I assumed my husband had woken up and come to check on me, but then I tried to look behind me and saw that it wasn't him who had touched me. Instead, I saw something black on the ground crawling towards me. I immediately jumped back from the shadow and it disappeared. I ran into our bedroom and woke my husband up, freaking out about what had happened. He told me it was probably just from my lack of sleep and that I should try to go to bed and get some rest. I know logically that would make sense, but I also know what I saw. And now I'm definitely not sleeping tonight. Update. A few days have passed and I think my husband is really starting to believe me. I say this because I was on the phone with a friend and told her about my experience that night. She immediately shared that she also had seen and heard things while visiting us, but didn't want to scare me by mentioning it. When I told my husband about this, he didn't seem that surprised. Then, a little while after ending the call, we were both getting our son ready for bed. I was silently scrolling Instagram while feeding our son, and my husband was in the same room just cleaning up a bit before bedtime. Keep in mind, we weren't talking, my phone wasn't making a sound, and the room went completely silent. All of a sudden our Alexa goes off. Seemingly completely, seemingly completely at random, she was talking about who the Arizona Cardinals are playing next. Not a threatening topic, but the sudden noise unsettled us. My husband had already started believing me after my friend spoke up, but I think that was the icing on the cake for him. So, I don't like that it seems to be fixated on the nursery or things to do with your son like his bottles. And I know that there are other parents, I've confirmed with other moms like me, that when my daughter was born, literally still to this day, she's two years old now, 
every time I would take a shower, I swore I heard her screaming and crying. And I was just like, wow, I can't like even take a shower and get a break for a second. And then I would come out and she's perfectly fine. She was asleep or she was playing or, you know, she was being fed. The shower stuff and, and hearing the cries and all that, I was kind of like, okay, maybe it's one of those mom things, you know, but then the bottle stuff happened in the nursery and I'm like, okay, you know, but from what you said, it seems less interested in him and more interested in being near him or sounding like him to interact with you and your husband. I hope things calm down sooner rather than later and that the baby stays protected and keeps doing well. Also, please take care of yourself and your postpartum depression if you haven't addressed it. It is one of the things that can quickly spiral. So please take care of yourself and congratulations on the birth of your child from all of us here at It's Haunted What Now. The next story is from This B5282 and it's just about as touching as it is heartbreaking. Hello, I'm a bus driver in a small town in England, and I think I've just picked up a passenger soul. This happened two nights ago. I've worked with this bus company for eight and a half years and have driven the same route for three of those years. Over this time, I have gotten regulars, passengers that I get to know as I see them multiple times a day. Some are young, some are old, and they take my bus to work or the shops or bingo. I often jump out to help my older passengers with shopping and whatnot. One particular passenger has been there for the full three years I have done this route. Let's call her Jane. Jane is an elderly lady who suffers from dementia. She was well-functioning for the last two and a half years. Sometimes she got a little confused, but all she needed was a little bit of patience and help to get to where she was going. I used to pick her up from the bus stop right outside her house, which was literally a 10-second walk from her door. Every day, I'd take her from her house to the local shopping center where she played bingo with friends. In the past six months, her dementia worsened. There was an incident on my bus where she got very confused and distressed to the point that I had to stop my bus to try and settle her down. Someone on the bus knew Jane's son, who thankfully worked close by and came over to help. I told my manager what was happening and he understood the situation and approved for my passengers to get off my bus and get the next one just behind me. This meant I could stay with Jane. Her son came and calmed her down, got her home, and thanked me for the help. We spoke about Jane, and I explained how we had become friendly the last few years I had been on the route. He said he knew, and she spoke fondly of me. He said he knew, and she spoke fondly of me. I commented that she hadn't freaked out like this before, and he told me that sadly her dementia had worsened, and this was causing her to have bad spells. He took my number and said he would get in touch to arrange a gift for looking after Jane. I insisted it was okay and I didn't want a gift, but he insisted. He took my number and his mother and left the bus. I never saw Jane again after that day, but I ran into her son at the shops. He told me that Jane had gotten worse and, unfortunately, wasn't safe to leave the house anymore. I thanked him for letting me know and wished her the best, and asked to be kept up to date with her condition. This leads to last night. I had been covering the late shift all week when, around 11.30 p.m., I was driving by Jane's house. The bus was completely empty, but as I approached the stop, I thought of Jane as I normally do. For some reason, I had the urge to stop at the bus stop outside her house, as if someone was waiting to board. I could see there wasn't anyone waiting, but the urge was so strong, I stopped anyway. I opened the doors and waited for a second. A cold rush of air entered the bus, so I closed the doors and drove on. I could feel a presence on the bus from that point onward, and about five minutes later, I felt someone next to my cab on the bus, like someone was waiting to get off. I stopped again and opened the doors, felt the presence leave, and continued my route, a bit confused. I fully believe in the paranormal, so when I got a call this morning from Jane's son to tell me she passed away, I broke down. He told me she had passed away two nights ago, in her own home, around 11 p.m. I had forgotten about the strange feeling I had that night with a presence on my bus until the funeral. I took the day off and attended the funeral for Jane, before going back to the son's house for the wake. The son's house was 30 seconds from the stop where I had let the presence off of my bus. 
I don't know if this is crazy or if I'm being stupid, but I picked up a presence from right outside Jane's house 30 minutes after she passed away and dropped it off at her son's house. Could I have really taken Jane's soul on a final trip to see her son before she passed on to whatever is beyond? I really want to believe I did, so I have comfort in the idea I drove her to see her son one last time. Does anyone else have an experience like this? Thank you, and sorry for the long read. Okay, so I can't for sure tell you what I experienced, but I truly believe Jane knew she had a genuine and kind friend in you. And I think it's beautiful that you were able to help her one last time. And I hope you can take some solace in her coming to you to bring her to her family. It was really sweet. Our third story is from Marie and might make you question those children's toys you still keep in your closet. I feel a purge coming on. Ever since I was a little girl, I've believed in everything spiritual. Ghosts, aliens, fairies, everything like that. My friend on the other hand, let's call her Sarah, was convinced that all of it was just stupid. That changed when we were about eight or nine years old. One day we were at our friend's place to spend the afternoon there. I don't know if this is something all little girls do, but at this age we used to go to the bathroom together so we could keep talking. So on that afternoon, I had to use the bathroom and asked Sarah to join me. When we entered the room, we realized that our friend had one of those big doll heads, the ones that are about the size of an actual child's head. You know, the sort of toy that you could use to practice doing makeup and hairstyles on. So I was sitting on the toilet and the doll head was straight in front of me, looking in my direction. My friend Sarah was standing at my side, also looking at the doll head. I told Sarah that I was getting weird vibes from it and it was scaring me, but she dismissed me and said I was just being dramatic. Then, almost in response, suddenly the doll just turned its head and looked in her direction. We both started screaming and ran out of the bathroom without even washing our hands. Years later, we were talking about this and Sarah was downplaying it by saying we were probably just making up the story. But I vividly remember this until this day, and the fact that we both started screaming at the same time is proof enough for me that this really happened. Well, you know, it sounds to me like Sarah is trying to convince herself that it didn't happen as much as she's trying to convince you. She doesn't say that she doesn't remember it. And I know exactly what you're talking about with those doll heads. Those things are creepy enough without moving, but if you recall my own personal spooky tale, my doll moved its head on its own, so I hate this story. Our next story is from Rainboot Season, who gives us some insight into what really goes on in the hallowed halls of Ivy League schools. I'm a student at Yale University. We have our main library, the Sterling Memorial Library, and within it, there are 14 floors of old book archives and long, dim hallways between shelves. We call it the Stacks, and it has a reputation at school for being an unorthodox hookup spot because of its vastness and overall eeriness. Yesterday, I experienced something that, even after 12 hours, has kept me terrified shitless. I typically study in the stacks, but yesterday was the first time I decided to work there at night. During the day, the stacks is dim, but the few windows at the end of each hallway allows for ample lighting. At night, the stacks is, understandably, more dark, and this makes it more difficult to navigate through. When I am at the stacks, this is my routine. I enter the fifth floor by taking the stairs, and I always go down three bookshelves to the left 
and walk to the end of the hall where a small desk and chair are seated. I do this because it is easy to get lost between the aisles of books and so I can remember where the exit is. Everything is fine until somewhere around 11.30 p.m. I do my studying in blocks, hour one for math, hour two for science, and so on, so I remember exactly what happened at 11.30 when I was done. The first was that all the lights shut off for a minute. When this happened, it didn't strike me as weird because the library closes at 12 a.m., and I assumed the library must have been closing earlier that night. But as I made my way towards the exit, things got really weird. I went to the middle of the hall and three bookshelves back to the right, like I always did, but I couldn't find the exit. I thought it was weird, but maybe I had miscalculated my steps. The stacks has exit signs posted on top of the ceiling on any given floor, so I looked for them, but there were no exit signs to be seen. And this was extremely weird given those signs are usually neon red. I walked for a bit until I saw an elevator and got in hoping that it would take me back to the lobby at floor one. What happened next was probably the weirdest thing I've ever experienced. I entered, pressed floor one, and heard the elevator rumble. I felt the elevator physically lower down, but when the doors opened, I was back at floor five. Now, this was when I was completely scared and started speed walking around the floor, stomping as loud as I could to attract anyone still in the stacks. I eventually found the main stairs and fled down what felt like an infinite number of floors before I finally reached the lobby again. When I was there, I found another exiting student and asked if they also experienced the one-minute power outage or the lights shutting off. They responded with, No and said that it must have been a problem on my floor instead. That really messed with my head, and I left ASAP. Needless to say, I don't think I'll be heading back there again. What the hell happened? Any ideas or thoughts? I might be able to take some videos of what I experienced when I'm back there during the daytime. Here's the thing. Libraries at night are already a liminal space without any other nonsense going on. In my college days, I was not going to be at the library past like 10 o'clock p.m. because I'm a paranoid person. Now, this almost sounds like some kind of blip in reality. If you recall, in a previous episode we did, there was an individual who experienced the same thing at their college where they took a elevator and they ended up in some warehouse thing and it was kind of nuts. So this is parallel in some way. It sounds like a trip to a parallel universe or a slip into the back rooms. But whatever did happen, it does seem like it targeted you specifically. I would be very much interested to hear if this happens again, and our email is open if you do get video evidence. Our final story in this episode is from Head Koala 7365 It brings us home with something small, but still not quite normal. So this morning, me and my family were sitting in the living room eating our cereal. Out of nowhere, we hear a sound of something dropping on the floor. My son stood up and scanned the room and spotted a coin that was on the floor by the armrest of the couch. He picked up the coin and held it up. He dropped it to see if the noise was similar and it sounded exactly the same. I brushed it off thinking that this coin must have been on the arm of the couch for some reason and slid off when one of us moved. Fast forward a couple of hours when we decided to go to the local park. We spent an hour or so there and came back. We sat down in the living room again, and within two minutes of sitting down, we heard the same noise again. This time, it was further away, coming from the hallway next to the living room. My girlfriend and I looked at each other suspiciously. She walked to the hallway to investigate. There was a coin on the floor of the hallway, right in the middle. There were no shelves or cabinets near it, and it could have fallen off. And both times we heard it, it sounded like it was dropped from straight up. There was no sound of rolling or scraping. My son had put the first coin into his dinosaur money box. We checked, and it was still there, so it wasn't even the same coin. Both coins were British 10 pence. That is the currency here, so that isn't strange. It's more that we don't really have coins lying about, 
They're not common in our house, or at least they weren't. Was just wondering if this is a known paranormal thing and if it means anything. So this isn't the first time that I've heard of something like this happening in my paranormal endeavors and research and listening to other amazing paranormal podcasts. I have heard in some cases that spirits will use coins to try and communicate with people. Maybe you have a friendly ghost saying hello or wanting to give your son some extra pocket money. I would keep an eye on it for the time being, but it isn't necessarily anything sinister, even if it's paranormal. Well, that does it for this episode. If you'd like to submit your own personal spooky tale to be read on the show, head to hauntedpod.com and click on the link to submit your story. You can also email me, hauntedpod at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a positive review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast player of choice. It really does help. You can find us on Twitter, for now, at podcast underscore haunted, Instagram at it's haunted what now or at hauntedpod.com. Production assistance by Jesse Hawk. The official composer and audio smith for the show is Neeks at We Talk of Dreams. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or WeTalkOfDreams.com. Until next time. Did you hear that? <laughs>